In this video, we finish up uh, organic reactions by looking at combustion, condensation, and polymerization reactions. There's really no link between these three, so this is just to kind of finish up the curriculum. And in this case, uh, combustion reactions are remarkably easy. Uh, we can escalate them a little bit, as you're going to see, by uh, showing you somewhat incomplete structures, and you kind of have to fill in the pieces. Uh, but we only consider complete combustion for the Alberta curriculum. Uh, incomplete combustion can occur. And so knowing that, for example, carbon monoxide is a really undesirable byproduct of com uh, incomplete combustion, probably, you know, reasonable thing to expect. Or that you make, you know, soot, carbon, uh, some portion of unburned hydrocarbon. That's uh, not too outlandish. Um, the next reaction we're going to look at is condensation. Uh, esterification is the main one, and since we've already looked at esters, that should be pretty straightforward. Lastly, you should be watching the uh, previous reaction video uh, on addition reactions to understand what an addition polymer is and kind of how the reaction goes. Uh, but polymers are long-chained uh, molecules. They're basically formed from monomers. And if you look at the type of monomer, the, the feature of the monomer, then you'll be able to tell what the polymer is going to be uh, that is created, whether it goes through an additional polymerization reaction or a condensation polymerization reaction. So let's have a look at combustion reactions first. Uh, here are a couple of components of uh, gasoline. And I would make the argument that uh, the easiest way of maybe navigating your way through this is to deal with the um, general formula of hydrocarbons, starting with the general formula of uh, alkanes. If uh, you remember, the general formula for an alkane is that if you know the number of carbons in that molecule, the number of hydrogens will be... 2n plus 2 in total. So let's say if we quickly wanted to predict how many um, hydrogens were in hexane, for example, we know that the hex root tells us that n is 6. So there should be 14 hydrogens in a molecule of hexane. So in the molecule above here, what we're going to do is first see if we can't deduce how many carbons there are there's the one carbon in the methyl group sticking up. And then, of course, we have five in the cyclopentyl portion here, or cyclopentane. So uh, what I'm going to do is suggest that every time that we have uh, just a straight chain uh, with no extra bonds, we can fall back to this formula, CnH2n plus 2. However, there is this cool concept called index of hydrogen deficiency that tells us that, for example, if we take uh, an alkane and we form a double bond somewhere along that chain, turning it into an alkene, two hydrogens are going to be removed from that molecule in order to make a double bond. In this example, though, we are looking at a ring, and a similar argument could be made. If you take the carbons at the end of a ring and you join them together, or sorry, carbons at the end of a chain, and you join them together to form a ring, uh, one hydrogen from each end, so two hydrogens in total, have to be taken out. So in this particular case, if we consider that the structure that we have here has six carbons in total, we have C6, and then uh, let's just use six as N for the time being. However, because we have formed the ring structure here, our index of hydrogen deficiency tells us that two hydrogens have to be removed from this total. So essentially what we're doing is we're trying to balance a combustion reaction involving C6H12. At this point, this is just straight regular balancing. It's nothing really exciting. So let's balance our hydrogens first. Balance our carbons, and then figure out how many oxygens we need, and 
we're done. So nothing really uh, terribly tough after that. I would argue the, the hardest part then is the entry point, figuring out what the formula is for the molecule as quickly as possible. And notice that I didn't actually draw out the molecule in total. I actually just deduced what the molecule's formula was. So let's do that again here. I've chosen a molecule that's a little more um, robust, so we have to work at it a little bit more. So in this case, uh, the methyls are understood. So there's a methyl up here and a methyl down here, so each with a carbon. Then I have a six-membered ring. Looks like that. So I have eight hydrogens in total. If I start with H2N plus 2, and then I consider the structure of the molecule, two hydrogens had to have been taken out to form the uh, ring. And then each of the double bonds removes an additional two uh, hydrogens. Okay. So if I do the algebra on that, I get 16 plus 2 minus 2 minus 6. So essentially, I'm working with a molecule that is C8H10. Okay, and once I know that, then I can go on and balance this just like usual. Uh, hydrogens first, then I can balance my carbons. And at this point, I can already tell that uh, I'm stuck using whole numbers. I could use a fraction on the oxygen if I wanted to. Although doubling is a very common strategy at this point, so what I can do is just say that I have two of these molecules, and then that would get me to the answer I need. Okay, so that's really combustion. Uh, if you have oxygen, uh, let's say you're burning an alcohol, it just becomes part of the CO2 or H2O that you would normally predict. Condensation, as you saw when we were talking about esters, is really rather straightforward. Um, in this case, in the previous video, it uh, was mentioned that uh, anytime water enters or leaves, as it does in this case, uh, during an organic reaction, sulfuric acid is a really good catalyst for that. So I'll add that in as a catalyst in both cases. Uh, it's notable also that uh, we typically have to heat up these reactions in order to make this work. And heat is often represented by a delta symbol. Okay, So in this case, if you notice I'm taking propane one all, uh, reacting it with ethanoic acid, and I'm trying to figure out what this reaction is going to look like in terms of making a product. Uh, so this particular product, I mean, I've already shown it there. Um, and if I recall correctly, this is something that has a smell like pears. Um, that would be propyl ethanoate. But maybe the question is, well, how did it get that way? In this case, we um, take the uh, proton from the acid, the sulfuric acid, and that is actually going to create a situation where we can get water off of this end of the molecule. Okay, uh, This hydrogen at the end of the hydroxyl is going to get lopped off and uh, replace the acidic hydrogen that we just uh, involved here. And then this oxygen over here is going to form a bond to where the water came off over here. And so that might actually be a little tough to just imagine, per se. Uh, so I would recommend physically moving these molecules around and maybe making it a little bit easier to, um, to see what's going on. So if I do that real quick here, so there was an H here. I'm going to kind of leave that off for a second. And if we imagine that we had the H2O there, and then we have the H's kind of sitting around here. Okay. So this is where the water came off. And now that is forming a new bond to the uh, propyl. Okay. So as a result, we've created propyl 
it had a weight, and then water has left kind of in the process. So in order to make this maybe a little bit tougher, I've chosen a um, secondary alcohol in this case, which is um, pent pentane 2 all, and I'm reacting it with ethanoic acid again. Uh, in this case, again, we're going to have to imagine that this is where the water leaves, and then I've got the hydrogen coming off of here, and that's leaving. And then this O over here is going to join up to that component uh, from the ethanoic acid, so the F backbone. So in this case, I'm actually going to have a branch that's sticking out of the way, and that's going to make things a little bit unusual. So if we kind of see what's going on here, so let's draw this out here. So I've got, so that CH3 is that one there, CH3, CH2, CH2, CH. Now, what's going to make the attachment between the alcohol and the carboxylic acid is actually the O, and I'm going to draw that in line with the molecule. And I'm going to take the methyl group here, and I'm going to stick it downward just for ease. And then that oxygen is going to come and join up with the carbon, like so. And then I get that. Okay, so a little bit strange, you kind of have a branch on a branch. And in this case, because uh, the oxygens kind of take priority as far as the numbering goes, on the branch, this is actually going to be carbon one of the branch. So this molecule would be called 1-methylbutyl-ethanoate. And uh, again, just having looked it up recently, it um, apparently has an odor kind of like bananas. So that's a little more complex of a condensation reaction. And there's the structure there. Okay. Addition polymers are molecules that take uh, a monomer, which is the building block. Uh, and the structure that's important here is the presence of a double bond in, in the molecule. So in this case, you'll notice that I have uh, a building block, which is the monomer, which is ethene. And what is happening is that I'm physically breaking the double bond Typically, this happens with a catalyst like platinum that is attuned to kind of breaking uh, double bonds like that. And uh, the result is that I create uh, the ability for the electrons in the middle to kind of split and position themselves in a place where I can now make a link between these two monomers. And basically, that process of having extra electrons around the outside allows for additional monomers to kind of join together. But in having broken the double bond, you'll notice that the representation of the polymer shows a single bond between the carbon chains. And that is actually correct. Notice that because this can happen to a large number of repetitions, we get the N representation down there. And just a quick note that uh, addition polymers are in fact pretty um, easy to name. If we know the name of the monomer, which in this case is ethene, then all you do is you add a prefix poly in front of the name of the monomer unit, which is not entirely intuitive because you'll notice that the polymer itself does not have a double bond. So you just have to remember that the way that the naming works is based upon the name of the monomer. Now, I've chosen a second monomer uh, whose diagram here is a little bit elusive. Uh, and it's because the double bond really isn't in a position where it makes sense about how to uh, join the monomers together. But as soon as we know that it's going to be an addition polymer, the fact that it does have the double bond here, I would make the argument 
that if you align, like the diagram above, if you align the monomers so that they kind of line up this way, then, well, I'm just going to going to force the molecule around and I'll have the methyl group from here sticking upward and then I'll go down here over to the oxygen from there have the other oxygen there the methyl group sticking over and then I'll do the same thing for the other one and then essentially what I'm going to do is I'm going to join the carbon from here and the carbon from here Okay, uh, break the double bond, have the electrons split apart, and then join it up to here or here. Okay, so I'm essentially going to try to form a bond in there. So, essentially what I'm going to do is I'm going to have this be the um, single bond there. That's going to stick down, double bond to the oxygen, O, like so. And then, of course, the bond continues that way and continues this way. But if we wanted to show it like it is above, then we can kind of take this notation, put it into a bracket, and then use the N representation to say that there's many, many copies of that. And you can see over at the end there, that's the uh, representation. I just have the groups on the first carbon and in that diagram it's on the second carbon. Last thing we have to look at is condensation polymers. Uh, like condensation reactions, essentially what we're doing is we're cutting out water through the use of some kind of a catalyst. Uh, and quite simply, if we imagine that from the acid, we are cutting out the OH here and then the H from the alcohol, you can see that we are joining a diol, which is this molecule here, with a diacid, which is this molecule here, by just uh, joining together the carboxyl group from the diacid to the H, uh, or the hydroxyl group from the diol. Uh, and then this basically just kind of patterns itself over and over again. So if you imagine that we can call the diol, in this case molecule A, and the diacid molecule B, the way that the polymer would be formed is that we essentially just alternate A, B, A, B, and so on. Again, a large number of times is represented by N. Uh, naming this type of a molecule is uh, super tough and probably not something that you'll have to do. Unless, of course, you have something like down below where the monomer is um, basically bifunctional. So it has both a hydroxyl group and a carboxyl group. So technically, it can actually join to itself in order to make the polymer that you're looking for. So in this case, it might be a little tough to see, but essentially what you're trying to do is take the OOH, sorry, that should be a C there, and you're trying to take the OH from the neighboring molecule and make the link between this oxygen and this carbon by taking water out of there. Okay, so it takes a little bit of mental juggling in order to see that forming up, but that would be explaining what's going on there. Uh, since this molecule on the left has a very simple name like lactic acid, then this molecule over here can simply be named poly lactic acid. So pretty straightforward as far as that goes. All right, so there's some information about polymers. Hope you enjoyed the video.